Hello, y'all. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Cross Cultural Center's Social Justice 101 workshop for the Triton Weeks of Welcome. Today, we'll be discussing breaking down intersectionality. Before we begin, I wanted to give a quick disclaimer that we will be recording today's workshop to post onto our YouTube channel. So if you want to view the workshop after we're finished, it will be available there. As you can see, we also just activated the Google Slides, Google Slides closed captioning, pardon. So the information might not be accurate as possible, but we will try our best. And we'd like to thank you in advance for your patience with any technological issues we might come about. So we'll first begin by giving y'all an idea of who we are and giving an introduction to ourselves. So I am Joss, I use they, she pronouns. I'm a third year social psychology major and I am one of the affiliates and leadership interns as well as a social justice educator for the Cross-Cultural Center this year. Hi everyone. I'm Joycey. I also, I go by she, her pronouns. I'm a third year electrical engineering major and my intern position is outreach and engagement as well as a social justice educator. Hello everyone. I, my name is Alina. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a fourth year biology major and I am the Jim Lynn alumni relations and development intern and social justice educator at the cross. Hey y'all, my name is Sara. My pronouns are she, they. I'm an incoming third year majoring in political science and ethics studies, and I'm one of the Joy de la Cruz art and activist interns. It is super nice to meet all of y'all. Before we begin today, we will first give a quick land acknowledgement. So I'll read this out for y'all. As you see, San Diego sits on the unceded territory and traditional homelands of the Kumeyaay people. We as members of the UC San Diego community must acknowledge the legacy of the Kumeyaay people. We also acknowledge that even as we work from home, we are still occupying indigenous lands. Please join me in a moment of silence to honor the original people of this land. Thank you, y'all. This resource I have included at the bottom of the slide is a number that you can text your city and your state to to figure out which tribes indigenous lands you occupy. This is a very useful resource that we got from the Intertribal Resource Center, and it's good to figure out your own positionality and what you are occupying. Now we're going to do a quick overview of what we're going to be presenting in this webinar. First, we'll be going over the community guidelines. This is what we, you can expect from us and what we expect from you all. Then we're gonna do a check-in question just to see where y'all are coming from. Then we'll define some key terms that are important to know about for this webinar. Then we'll be breaking down privilege and intersectionality. We'll be giving y'all resources to expand your understanding and so you could utilize them. And then we have some any questions and an open discussion that we have. So let's go over the community guidelines. So first is a brave space. We are a brave space. This is a very open space that we use as a learning space. And we will ask questions to discuss about, or we might ask if y'all have any questions. So please try to be comfortable enough to answer or ask any questions you may have. Lean into your discomfort. The things we may be discussing might be uncomfortable for some of y'all. So we ask that you lean into that because it can possibly be a learning experience for you. Vegas rule, if you know that Vegas saying, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. So what is said here stays here and what is learned here leaves here. So for example, if someone were to say a personal story here, don't talk about it to other people. But if you're going to learn about intersectionality and privilege, which you will, go ahead and teach people about it if you want to. Challenge the idea, not the person. So what we discussed today will be informative. So if you have a question about the information or want to challenge the idea, please don't challenge us or attack us personally, personally because this is meant to be an informative and a learning experience for everyone. 
Yes, as Joycey mentioned, we'll first be doing a check-in question in order to get a good idea for who y'all are and where y'all are coming from. So the questions are, where are you from? What brought you to our workshop? And what do you expect to learn today? So you can go ahead and use the chat option. Make sure that you send it to all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see. And we'll give you all some time to respond. You don't have to answer all of them. You can answer a few. That is up to you. all Um, Sit Lali said, it's coming in. I'm from West Covina, which is Tongva land. That's very good to know. Hey, y'all. I'm Tiffany. I'm from the IE, and the Instagram brought me to the workshop. Claire said, coming from Illinois, saw the post for this workshop on your Instagram, mainly just looking to learn how I can be more active in promoting social justice and educating myself. Thank you for sharing. Hi, I'm a transfer student from Illinois. Hello, all of y'all are from some cool places. Amberly says, hello, my name is Amberly. I am from San Luis Obispo, California. Wanted to join this workshop after going through the intersection about the CCC yesterday. Hello. Ooh, there's so many. Blanca said, hello, I am Blanca Lozano. I am a transfer student. This quarter is my first at UCSD. Here to learn about student clubs and organizations I can join. I'm a sociology major as well and would like to become a part of new spaces to make new friends. From San Diego, Instagram brought me here, hoping to learn some facts I didn't know. From Orange County, I care about social justice, so I thought I'd pop in and learn about something new. Angelo said, Carson, I came to the workshop because of the Facebook post. I joined so I can learn more about social justice. Annie saw it on the Instagram as well. Indiana also saw on Instagram. Someone from the men's soccer team and the coach provided them with the resource. I'm very glad that y'all got it through that. Anna is from North California, originally from Mexico. Sacramento and found us on the virtual student union. All of y'all are from such diverse places. I will read through the ones later, but not out loud anymore. So y'all know how to use the chat now. You can feel free to ask us any questions throughout the workshop. You can also use the Q&A option at the bottom and we'll try to get to your questions as we can. We can advance to this slide. So first we'll go over the five Ps of social justice education. These five Ps help create a foundation on, all on which all social justice discussions revolve around and they can be referred back to. These terms are all a good backbone of knowledge to have when you're going into spaces trying to do social justice activism work so you know what people are talking about and you know what to say. So the first P is power and power describes the dynamics in society and acknowledges that those that do hold social power are the ones that have the ability the access to and the control of different societal resources. Position refers to how we interact with each other in society. So it refers to social status, class and occupation or different things that might affect your position in different social hierarchies. We have privilege, which we will break down a little bit more later but it describes who holds societal advantages and who has representation in media and different educational resources. These representations go into perception, which is the different beliefs and stereotypes that folks develop in their heads based on how they were socialized by their surroundings. So this might be through media, through culture, through their school or different aspects of their upbringing. The last P is process, which refers to the level of awareness and exposure that you have to your own social identity, as well as that of others, and what you choose to do 
either to mobilize or not mobilize yourself after learning about these social dynamics. All right, y'all. So now we're going to be discussing the main key terms that will be discussed throughout the presentation. First up, we have identity, which are a set of characteristics that make up how one categorizes themselves, themselves in society. And it's also known as like a social categorization because oftentimes these categories are placed on us. Next up, we have privilege, which are social advantages that an individual receives by belonging to a certain social identity. And lastly is intersectionality, a social justice lens through which we can see where systems of power interlock and intersect with each other based off of our multifaceted identities. And we will be expanding on privilege and intersectionality throughout our presentation. You were given this definition of privilege social advantages that an individual receives by belonging to a certain social identity. Now we're going to break down what it means to be privileged because too often people misunderstand what it means and they fail to see the ways that they are privileged. Privilege gives us advantages or special rights that not everyone has access to. Most of us experience some kind of privilege in our lives. Society grants privilege to people because of certain aspects of their identity. Aspects of a person's identity can include race, class, gender, sexual orientation, language, socioeconomic class, ability, and religion, to name a few. These are the groups that social identities are divided by the dominant group and the subordinate group. The dominant group can also be referred to as the majority. They have advantages compared to other social groups in society. They have superior resources and rights. The privileged group has access to power over the oppressed groups. An example of identities falling into this category can be someone who identifies as white as a man, as heterosexual, or as abled body. The subordinate group can also be referred to as the minority group. These are they are disadvantaged compared to other social groups in society. They face unequal treatment, prejudice, or discrimination. The oppressed group lacks the same treatment as the majority. An example of identities falling into this category can be someone who identifies as Black, as a woman, as part of the LGBTQ plus community, or as folks with dis disabilities. Privilege is the other side of oppression. Society disenfranchises people who fit into the subordinate group in order to empower the dominant group. Getting educated on issues of diversity and social justice can be challenging. People are often resistant to reevaluating their beliefs about themselves, others, and the world. Questioning your own assumptions can feel emotionally and intellectually threatening, and it is possible to struggle when examining your privileged identities. So to help alleviate, here we are going to break down what having privilege does, doesn't mean versus what it does mean to have privilege. So first, privilege does not mean you're a bad person. It is just about the circumstances of your life that give you benefits you never asked for. Privilege does mean there's a whole system at work. It's about an entire systems that favor groups and put down others. And later on, we will break down the cycle of systematic oppression. Having privilege does not mean you haven't experienced oppression in other ways. For example, being an able-bodied person doesn't erase my struggles of identifying as a woman. Privilege can come in more than one form and so can oppression. 
the systems of oppression don't work in isolation. So for a woman who comes from a lower social class and identifies as black, has classism, racism, and sexism all working together against her. Privilege does not mean you didn't work hard or should feel bad about your good fortune. Acknowledging our privilege doesn't negate your hard work or mean you've never faced personal hardship. It does mean that a lot of folks can't access what privileges you experience, no matter how hard they work. Even if some folks can overcome certain challenges of one system, they still face the different challenges from a different system of oppression. It does not mean you never been put down by that privilege identity. Having privilege refers to systematic benefits of your own identity. Recognizing that having privilege does not require feeling guilty for your privilege. Each of us has likely has experienced an element of privilege. Essentially, it is meant to open your eyes in ways we benefit from by systems and how we can work to make the world a fairer place. It does mean that we participate in discriminatory systems in different ways. Whether this be implicit or explicit, we all have biases that stem from our upbringings. So I would encourage you all to reflect on your own bias. You may recognize and work to learn, unlearn and dismantle these systems of oppression. Pointing out privilege doesn't mean hating on people who have it. Pointing out privilege means supporting the privileged group. For example, fem feminism is not about hating men. Pointing out male privilege and advocating for gender equality is about, isn't about trying to bring down men. It promotes gender equality, meaning that everyone gets the support they need. Having privilege does not mean there's nothing you can do about it. It means you have a choice about what to do with it. You can embrace the realities of what it really means to have privilege. You can use your privilege to advocate for and center the voices of people who are marginalized in multiple ways. Understanding and engaging in self-reflection and discussions about privilege is an essential part of addressing individual and systemic inequalities in our society. And I encourage you all to do a self-reflection of your own privilege. As Alina has mentioned, taking time to practice your own self-awareness, as well as learning about other folks' stories and their background is important in social justice spaces and even in society as a whole. So this question that we are asking now is how can we navigate our subordinate identities as college students specifically, or even our dominant identities? So for this question, an example I might have is that I do have a lot of privileges as a college student, even being in this space and possibly taking the spot of folks who may not have access to higher education. But due to some of my subordinate identities, such as being queer or being gender nonconforming, I might have different access to resources than someone who is cisgender and heterosexual on campus. So I can use these parts of my identity to bring up other folks who may not have privilege that I do and educate folks outside of this um, secondary education space. But I also do need to advocate for myself in spaces where I do not feel as privileged. So y'all can feel free to use the chat to answer this question as well.
Sada has shared, I found comfort in building community with folks that share same identities as me, as there was a lack of space on campus, which makes a lot of sense if y'all can think about, you'd be able to find solidarity with people that you can share experiences with and have struggles and adversities that other folks who are not in the same identities as you might not know about. So thank you for sharing, Sada. Claire said, being more open-minded to the larger group of students slash various identities you'll be meeting in college, striving to learn more about your own privileges and or others' struggles to help each other. That is a very good answer. Even y'all being here is showing that y'all are more open-minded and learning to, or willing to learn and putting yourself out there to do that. So I do commend y'all. Sitlali said, making sure that in conversations where I have a dominant identity, I step back and give others space. That is also a very good point, especially in classrooms or class discussions. Fatima said, when I first think of navigating my subordinate identities, I first have to reflect on what my identities are and how they are perceived slash how I behave. Blanca said, I've been getting involved in student clubs and organizations. Having a space to honestly and openly talk about our experiences is such an important part of identifying our privileges and struggles and how to move forward with those. So that kind of brings back to what Sara had said. I think Alessandra is also agreeing. Surrounding yourself with people who look like you is super comforting. We must acknowledge our own privileges as well as we will be interacting with a diverse population on campus. Anna said, Something that helps me is reminding myself that I'm comfortable in a lot of ways because of who I am and not realizing that everyone is in that position. That's very true. Ulysses, I believe, said, I can do my best to recognize my implicit biases and address them to treat others equally. That is very, very true. For those of y'all who might not know, implicit biases are biases that you have that are learned but not explicitly expressed. So it's not necessarily something that you're meaning to think or want to think it's just how you've been socialized as I brought it before. Something that I've heard before is that you can control, you can't control your first thought, but you can control your second one. So you might not able to necessarily control how you think of somebody, what your first thought of them is, because that's how you've been socialized to think of them as and different stereotypes, but you can control how you move forward and how you think of them beyond that, if that any of that made sense. <laughs> Okay, thank y'all for sharing. You can continue typing if you need a little bit more time, but we can move on now. Next, we need to understand privilege in the context of power systems. We are going to talk about how privilege is branched and maintained by the systems of oppression. Privilege is about entire systems that favor some social groups and put others down. This is a model for visualizing the systematic nature of oppression, adding clarity to the abstract concept of the systems of oppression. Society is affected by a number of different power systems, including patriarchy, white supremacy, heterosexism, and classism, to name a few. These systems interact together in order to create privileged groups to have power over oppressed groups. Most of us aren't taught that these systems are such an influential part of the way the, wor the world works. This visual shows this cycle that centers around power, control, and economics. It starts with being born into a society where things set systematic treatment mistreatment of targeted social groups. It continues into justification for further mistreatment or oppression based on the effects of having certain characteristics or identified with certain social groups. Institutions perpetuate and enforce this cycle. Then there's this occurrence where internalized dominance and internalized oppression takes place. Internalized dominance is where the majority feels or acts 
superior towards the targeted group and an internalized oppression where the minority groups believe the misinformation about their own selves. The cycle continues by society's acceptance of oppression and privilege and normalizes these practices. Misinformation is generated and the cycle of systematic oppression continues. Privileged people are more likely to be in positions of power. For example, in a white supremacist, white supremacist society, people of color who don't have race-based institutional power. It's important to understand the systems of oppression because privilege doesn't go both ways. For example, female privilege doesn't exist because women don't have institutional power based on their gender. It's also important to remember because people often look at privilege individually rather than systematically. While individual experiences are important, we have to try and understand privilege in terms of systems and social patterns. As we work to create and participate in diverse environments, we need to understand how our own and others' identities affect our lives and our interactions with each other. Privilege, like oppression, is intersectional. As I explain intersectionality, we're going to be able to see the connections between intersectionality, identity, and privilege, which you may not explain very well. This is Kimberly Crenshaw, a civil rights activist and a scholar of critical race theory. And she's the person that coined the term intersectionality in 1989. She used the term to describe how all of our identities change the way each of us experience oppression of course, depending on the positionality of these specific identities, right? Back to the definition that was displayed earlier in our presentation, intersectionality is a social justice framework slash lens that refers to the ways in which our identities intersect with each other and create specific experiences within systems of oppression. This graph was taken from Kimberly Crenshaw's TED Talk, which we'll be linking on later in the presentation. And it depicts a crossroad intersection where with the streets labeled with systems with a, ver a variety of systems of oppression. So listed, we have homophobia, transphobia, racism, xenophobia, sexism, classism, ableism, and heterosexism. Now, depending on your identities, it, uh, it affects which systems of oppression you actually interact with and how they affect you. The case of, and I hope I'm pronouncing this right, D. Graffenreid versus General Motors was one of the first few court cases that really established what intersectionality was in terms of like the courts. And uh, this case was a case where five black women sued General Motors, a car making company on the basis of race and sex discrimination. A little bit of context, during 19, yeah, 1964, the Civil Rights Act passed, which made it unlawful to discriminate on the basis of race, color, religion, national origin, as well as sex. This company hired Black women like around the late, the late 1960s. However, due to the 1970s recession, they laid off folks. And the people, that they that the people that they laid off all happened to be Black women, which is why these, these women were suing the company, right? However, General Motors argued that they were, not, they were not discriminating anyone on the basis of sex or race as they were hiring Black folks and they were hiring women. What they failed to note, though, was that they were only hiring Black men to do like the hard, difficult labor, the physical labor, as well as women, specifically white women, doing the administrative work inside, inside the company. And this is why intersectionality is so important, as it points out that, in this case specifically, right, Black women 
they weren't really being centered in this in this discourse within the court. Their experience was being invalidated as no as there is no framework to see that you can be both affected by sexism and racism at the same time. Now we'll be showing a short video, a cute but very informational video describing what intersectionality is. I'm going to talk to you about intersectionality. You know what that means? You want me to explain it? Yeah. So intersectionality is a concept that allows us to realize that people live like multi-dimensional lives. So for example, if someone is a black woman and they're black and they're also a woman, it's important to look at the possibility that they may experience sexism as well as racism at the same time. So are you saying that like, say sexism is not experienced by like everyone in the same way? Exactly. Thinking about and being conscious of the fact that we have a bunch of different things that make up our identity. Um, yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, that kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. because, if, because I'm light-skinned, mm -hmm. and people think that I'm white, but I'm First Nations. Mm -hmm. Intersectionality also is like a big puzzle from your toes to your head, tip top of your head. I I don't know, I don't understand how, what this is actually meaning. Every single part that's in you has to make you, you. Oh, no, I get it. I get it now. So people aren't just the one picture. The whole picture basically has to need your whole entire personality going together to make you. Wow, thank you. That's really cool. Mm. High five. Girl, you have to do this because boys have to do this. Only, only boys can go to this specific club. You have to have this certain amount of Pokemon cards to be in this club. Mm -hmm. And that's basically what it goes like. I hope y'all enjoyed this video as much as I did. I appreciated how the fact that at the beginning, everyone was just learning. And by the end of it, they were all basically social justice educators, right? They were all able to break down what intersectionality was to each other in a very clear and concise way. Now, I really appreciated how these, these educators talked about gender roles, privilege, and how like variety of positions within your identity all relate back to intersectionality and one's experience. As they were saying, we're all, uh, each individual is like a big picture or a big puzzle, as one of them said, and our identities are the details that make us who we are. For example, these are my specific identities. My, I identify it with being Latinx. Uh, my sexuality is a big part of who I am. I'm bisexual. I'm also temporarily able-bodied. I identify with being part of the working class as well as being light-skinned, right? And each of these identities, while some are impacted identities, I'm also, I also hold certain privileges. For example, although I'm part of the Latinx community, I'm also very light-skinned, which does give me white passing privileges, so I do benefit from white supremacy in certain situations or like under certain contexts. But I'm also Latinx, but I'm also part of the LGBT community, right? And that itself means that I have to face these systems of homophobia as well as xenophobia all under the same roof. Now, it's important to note that these systems of oppression are working simultaneously so for example, when, when a person perceives me or looks at me, they're not just looking at one part of my identity, but they're looking at all parts of my identity, like everything that makes me me. Even though some of these identities are invisible, such as my sexuality, I am very like cis het passing, which means that, well, how do I explain this? Okay, that I, I present myself as, or I pass as someone that's straight, right? That's heterosexual. No one has to question my sexuality but I'm also, 
Yeah. Um, it's also important to note that this is not a single access framework. It's very important to, to note that we're taking a look at a variety of our identities. We're not one dimensional beings. Our identities make us multi-dimensional beings, which means that we experience very unique experiences under these systems of oppression. For example, when Crenshaw was, or when the term intersectionality was getting popular, white, fem white feminism was, was at its height and white, fem white feminism was ignoring the experiences of black women, um, Latinx women, as well as like black folks, black folks part of the LGBT community. And one, one, big, one big example that I can think of this is the, the LGBT movement. So like the Stonewall riots, many, many of the people at the forefront of this movement were black trans folks. But if you look at the history books or the, the little that's taught in our public education system, we're, we're only taught big um, like white LGBT activists. Now, a common argument that conservatives hold is that intersectionality is just a tool that's being used to, to see who's victimized the most. So kind of like, like a competition on who's the most victimized and this is not what intersectionality should be used as. The intention of this framework is to center the experiences of those that are most impacted slash marginalized and eventually to remove these power dynamics. We can't remove these power dynamics if we don't realize the impacts that the variety of these systems are having on, on folks. Okay, so we'd like to bring a few applications of this into y'all's real life so we could get some uh, self-reflection even if you don't share it. So as those of y'all who are first years or transfers transition into this new period of life, it is important to point out how your experiences will change going into a college space or a different college space and thinking about how your own personal dynamics and positionality will change, especially if others don't have a knowledge of the inter intersectional aspect of your identity and they can't see you as a whole compounded person. And even those who have been on campus for a while can see how their dynamics play out in the UCSD community. So we'd love to hear from all of y'all of course, as you are comfortable with sharing in this brave space, we're asking what aspects of your identity do you feel have been overlooked, especially in educational spaces? So this could refer to when you were in high school, middle school, elementary school, even in college for some of y'all. We'd love to hear you answer, so we'll give you some time to do that. I can give a quick example, a personal example. Um, I identify with being part of the working class and I feel like especially in school, professors as well as other resources don't take into account that not only am I a full-time student, but I also have jobs in order to sustain myself. And oftentimes I don't get that, that space or that support that I need from educators. That is a good point to make. Thank you for sharing, Sara. Alessandra shared, being system impacted myself, I have seen how other system impacted folks and formerly incarcerated students have been pushed to the side, overlooked, deemed as inferior and ignored in many ways as we don't currently have our own space or resource on campus. And that I can definitely agree with. I've seen it even in my own dynamics on campus and 
it's especially important to point out how UC San Diego does benefit from system impacted folks and incarcerated labor. There are a couple of organizations on campus that you might want to, sorry if you can hear the leaf blower outside, um, you might want to connect yourself with. There's the Underground Scholars Initiative, which connects folks that are system impacted with resources that they might be able to use, as well as Students Against Mass Incarceration, which educates about the prison system and the inequalities and equities in there. Anna says, I was born in a foreign country, and when I moved to the US, I had to catch up in English. But since I look the way you do, I was overlooked, and that was a challenge for me. Yeah, definitely being not having English as your first language is a big struggle, and it's not one that's talked about a lot. I agree. Sitlali said, In educational spaces, I feel like my immigration and coming from an immigrant family is incredibly overlooked, which ties back to what Anna said. Um, Nico said, all throughout high school, I was never viewed as Latinx because I'm light skin and white passing. It felt a bit alienating to see other Latinx folks group up in the halls or at lunch. It also felt strange to see teachers practice their limited Spanish with kids who were darker skinned or spoke, openly spoke Spanish to friends, but not do the same with me. So yeah, that goes back to positionality, you getting, what's the word, profiled differently and being treated differently, despite that being an aspect of your identity. And as Sada said, even being light-skinned and white passing is a privilege, but it also has its own dynamics in society, as you discussed. We'll give y'all a couple more seconds to answer. You can keep answering after that if you'd like. personal example I think I could give is, as I said before, being gender non-conforming. Uh, there usually aren't a lot of resources. In high school, I saw a lot of people that had transitioned being dead named a lot because they couldn't change their names in schools or being referred to with the wrong pronouns. And UCSD does have tools that you're able to change your gender identity and able to change your pronouns through the system, which I feel is very important. And it wasn't something I had seen until I came into college. Fatima shared, personally, the struggles of being Black Muslim and female are often overlooked in educational spaces. That's why I find it so important to participate in different orgs so they can consider what members they might not serve as well. Yeah, that's a great example of intersectionality and how your identities come together. And you may other see other folks that are Black or Muslim or female, but not all of those uh, identities intersecting into one person like with you. I think we are able to move on now. Thanks y'all for sharing. Most of us have identities that are part of both privileged groups and oppressed groups, and these identities can be intersectional. While it's critical to understand the complexity of privilege in society as a whole, it is useful to focus on individual aspects of identity to develop a greater awareness of our social positions. So how you can do your part. Affirm all identities. To reinforce that all social groups have valuable qualities and that just because you might identify with certain social group, it does not determine your worth or goodness. Second, examine how differences matter. Once we acknowledge our various identities, we can see how different identities can lead to different perspectives, experiences, and access to power and privilege. Show that people receive privileges whether or not they recognize. When looking at power and privilege, it's critical to highlight that people from privileged groups receive advantages regardless of whether they are aware of them or want them. Emphasize the systematic nature of oppression. This can reduce defensiveness and resistance against privilege. Although each person plays a role in systems of inequality, all systems are larger than any one individual. Understand how everyone has been socialized to develop distorted views and fill narrow roles. And finally, be an ally. 
work to dismantle any form of oppression from which those who are privileged receive benefit from. Exploring your privileged identities may lead to negative feelings and discomfort, but remember that discomfort is a part of the growing process. And by becoming more aware, you can increase your effectiveness at working in and contributing to a diverse world. The goals of social justice is not to simply change who benefits from unequal systems, but to ensure that all people are treated with respect and have equal access to power and resources. Uh, I just wanted to share something that Annie, I believe, said during in the chat, she said, or they said, sorry, personally, in my experience, I feel like being an LGBTQ plus or lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer plus person of color has been very overlooked. For example, at school, we would, sh we would barely learn about any Asian figures in any class or any Asian LGBTQ plus at all. I also feel like because of the model minority myth, teachers would assume that because I'm Asian, I would never struggle in school. And when I do, they are surprised. So as I had said, that is another great example of intersectionality and how it can affect different things like representation and privilege. So thank you for sharing, Annie. And for also bringing up the model minority myth because that's an important social dynamic when it comes to race and systemic oppression. Oh, and we have another question for y'all. Um, before we go into what resources we can provide for y'all, we wanted to get a good feeling for what y'all have learned and where y'all get your resources from. So the question is, what kind of resources have you utilized in the past to educate yourself on social justice issues? So this will give us a good basis as well as provide us or anyone else any resources that we may not have heard of. We'll give this about three minutes, maybe a little less. Sit Lolly said, Twitter, LOL, a lot of really good threads. I do agree, Twitter is a great resource, but it is one of those places where you kind of have to be careful about who's saying what and whether or not everything's um, accurate. Anna said, reading books. There are so many books with different perspectives, even just on social media, there is so much to learn from. There's a lot of good academic books out there that talk about different theories and different um, you can get the viewpoint of different peoples from different identities easily. Tiffany shared one of my favorite mediums that I use to educate myself is whew, honestly my Instagram feed or explore page in addition to the CCC Instagram features great stories about individuals who are passionate about social justice. I definitely agree Instagram is a good resource and it's becoming even more useful nowadays. Annie shared articles, videos, books and documentaries. Alessandra shared a website for y'all called democracynow.org. It's a great use source recommended by a UCSD professor, Dr. Childs. Blanca said a lot of reputable organizations that are constantly posting content on relevant Instagram. Fatima said, I love watching the news, documentaries, and Instagram. These are all really great sources of where you can get good information about different, from different sources and different facets of identity. I think in the interest of time, we'll move on right now, but y'all can keep sharing your resources for each other and for us in the chat. I'll read one more. Nika said, personally, when I was discovering on my own, my own gender identity, I found many YouTubers who openly shared their experiences with coming to terms with identity and also welcoming spaces versus non-welcoming. That is also a very good platform that I hadn't even thought of, having different like vloggers and stuff like that that you can look up to and identify yourself with and share experiences with is good as well. So now we're gonna be talking about some online resources you could use if you want to learn more about intersectionality or any other social justice topics. So here I have the intersectionality TED Talk by Kimberly Crenshaw herself. It's called The Urgency of Intersectionality. You could find it on TED.com, just search up urgency of intersectionality and you'll it'll be right there. It's about a 20 minute video, it's very informational. I think it will be really helpful if you still want to learn more about 
this topic. You could also search it up on YouTube. It should be there. The Get Informed Card website is a site that provides uh, information about everything happening around the world, not just in the United States, but everywhere around the world. You go on the website, it shows all the different countries that you could see what's happening. It provides some information. It also provides petitions and donations that you can utilize if you want to send the petitions or donate. And here are some Twitter and Instagram handles that you could follow. These are all activists that use their platform to give infographics for important topics. So if you wanna go follow those, those people go ahead and follow them. The Cross-Cultural Center also has their own resources. We have our social media. Here's our Instagram and our Facebook. These, our social media contains social justice educational campaigns. One of them is called Breaking It Down with the CCC, which is a series that provides information on different social justice topics. Go ahead and check out our posts. I think they're very informational and also very interesting topics that you can learn about. Black Voices is also an educational campaign that highlights Black creatives. So you can learn about different Black artists or a Black vegan cook, stuff like that. Uh, you could also go to our YouTube, which provides different past recordings and webinars on different social justice topics, and even a virtual tour of the Cross-Cultural Center if you want to see what it looks like in real life. And the QR code in the middle, if you scan that, it will link you to the link tree, which provides you access to all our social media, as well as the Cross-Cultural Center's website and to sign up for the e-news if you want to keep in touch with us. So I'll give you a little time to scan the QR code if you need to. Okay, let's continue. So the Cross-Cultural Center is one out of six campus resource centers at UCSD. So here I provided the names of the other five resource centers as well as uh, programs and services for another group. So we have the Women's Center, the Black Resource Center, the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender Resource Center, LGBT Resource Center, the, Ra the Raza Resource Center, the Intertribal Resource Center, and the Asian Pacific Islander Middle Eastern Desi American Programs and Services. So this last one is just a program, it's just a service. It's not a resource center yet, but I will provide the Instagrams of all these resources in the chat if you want to get to know them more. So now we're gonna open up the chat for any questions y'all may have about anything from this webinar. So feel free to Ask some questions or comments if you have any comments for us. Alexa Osuna asked, does anyone know of any good books? I just bought a book called The Gender Outlaw. I'm pretty sure it's by, let me make sure I get their name right, Kate Bornstein. So that one talks a lot about being gender queer and LGBTQ issues. So that's a little more what I'm into, but I do recommend that book a lot. Um, another one is, I think it's called Cast. Let's see who that. I want to make sure I get everyone's name right. Sorry about that. So cast is by Isabel Wilkerson. It's about the origin of our discontents and kind of the history of the caste system and how it functions in the US. I would recommend both of those books. If anyone else has any good ones, you can add it in the chat as well. Blanca said, on a side note, my climate activist club at UCSD called Green New Deal used an intersectional approach to speak about climate change. We are also always looking for new members. So join our club. So if anyone is interested, 
feel free to meet me at email me sorry at b l oh b lo lozano at ucsd.edu sorry about that so if you want to contact them or if green new deal wants to contact the cross-cultural center for some collaborations you can do that as well anna said dear america is a great book Alice said, loved your presentation. Super informative and in-depth. Thank y'all. I have a few good books I'll type right now. Fatima shared a book by Sean King. Alessandra shared one by Leonard Peltier. Blanca has another one from The Green New Deal. And then Alessandra said, Asata, an autobiography by Asata Shakur. Let Me Live by Angelo Herdinson. Golden Gulag by Ruth Wilson Gilmore. Yes, please feel free to collaborate with us. We would love to have a workshop with y'all. Tiffany asked, oh, if we can go to the next slide very fast or the one after this, sorry. This is our contact if, info if you want to contact us, keep in touch with us. Yeah. So quickly get that down. Take a picture real fast. Okay, and then the next slide, we do have a input survey for y'all to answer. We please answer, ask that everyone answers this. Um, you'll all answer some questions about the workshop and how it went. And we please ask that you do add comments on the survey. Towards the end of the form, there will be a space for y'all to type in any comments that y'all have about how this workshop was, what you learned and stuff like that. So we'll leave this up and answer more questions if y'all feel like asking more. Tiffany said, how can I navigate my privileges and make sure that I'm not implicitly discriminating against individuals who do not share the same identities? I feel like that again just goes back to being self, increasing your own self awareness as well as increasing your awareness of other people's identities and ensuring that you're doing your best to be inclusive in your language and in your and how you act. Everyone does make mistakes and you do have to ask for a bit of forgiveness if you do accidentally hurt someone, but just practicing self-awareness and practicing being as accepting and understanding of others does help a lot with that. Corey said, right, white fragilities, fra fragile, I don't know how to pronounce that word, is a great book about white defensiveness in regards to race relations. I also, I had went into Barnes and Noble the other day, one of them in La Jolla, and they had a table all on books highlighting like race dynamics and highlighting black authors. So if you do wanna get books in person as safely as you can, Barnes and Noble did have a great resource when it came to that. Fatima asked the question earlier saying what oh, I missed webinars, it. future webinars will be host, y'all will be hosting. Well, oh. shameless plug, me, my co and I are doing this new program called Cooking with the Cross-Cultural Center. We will be putting out a video week one on gourmet ramen, but from the top ramen. So check that out. Follow our Instagram so you could see how we make our ramen at home. Yeah, I would say the best place to look for our webinars would be Either our Instagram, we have different infographics on there, or our Facebook will have um, events that we create on there and you can write attending and get recommendations for white fragility. That's how you pronounce it. <laughs> we have one more minute if anyone wants to ask any more questions. You can also contact us further on. And before we end, we wanted to thank y'all for coming and feel free to contact us and stay informed through our social medias on there. Oh, that question scared me. <laughs> thank you for joining us today. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you, y'all. Thank you all for joining. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Yes, you can email us at ccenter at ucsd.edu or contact us through our Instagram. The, the email will probably be your best bet as to um, getting through to us. <laughs>